Today our subject is self-expression through language. In other words, writing. Today we're going to talk about... And everybody's got a set of goggles. Everybody thinks his own set was given to him by God and is universal, natural, and supposed to be. And what he's saying, he says, just for a minute, think of the possibility that maybe your set of goggles is, is a private, idiosyncratic set of goggles. And suppose that that the generation before had a different set of goggles and you got this set of goggles and you both think you're looking at it the same way and you're not. We all read things differently. We all insert meaning into things when it's not there. We all read things through our experience. We all insert things into the text that we're not supposed to insert into the text mainly because we do not know how to see. We don't know how to see. We think we know how to see, but we don't. And so today we're going to walk through how to see, or better yet, how to sit in the text and make observations. You need to learn how to see things. And the only way to see things is by expanding the world out and pointing out what you see. Reading critically is kind of like a where's Waldo. You're trying to find the particular thing, Waldo. Things get interesting because in the midst of your search, you're actually encountering all of these things that are kind of trying to throw you off, or they're trying to entertain you, or they're trying to show you something different. You can't see these things. You can't get in on the joke if you're not really looking. If you just say, I can find Waldo by finding something with red and white, you'll go off into all these places, but you won't find Waldo because the book is trying to distract you. It's trying to trick you into thinking that you've found Waldo when actually you've probably found some guy fishing or some funny joke or gag that's trying to be like, ha ha, I gotcha. If you're not examining the context, if you're not going through and asking questions and searching and presenting observations, then what's actually going to happen is the, aha, I got you, will actually take you off into a place where you might completely misunderstand the text. And you might actually read meaning into something that can be dangerous. For example, QAnon, and this right here is one of those things where when people are not examining something critically, they get off into the weeds and they find something like a man fishing and go, aha, that I think is Waldo. And it's not. And instead of saying, okay, I was wrong, maybe Waldo is somewhere else, we've gotten to the point where we're now not caring about the observations and what's there. We're now caring about how well we can defend our interpretation. This is why you are in this class. You're learning how to read critically, first to understand what's going on in the text and observe and understand all of the things that are being said before you yourself say, this is what I think and this is how I believe things. And this, is, this is it. This is right. Blah. You're trying to take what is there in the text first. So let's do a couple of things with that. What Cameron does in Ferris Bueller's Day Off is exactly what we need to do when we encounter a text. We have to sit in the text. We have to be comfortable with sitting in the text and making observations. And so here's how you do that. You start asking yourselves questions like, are there any repeated words? Are there any words that I don't know? Are there any words that are trying to convey something very impactful by using really punchy words? Are there any words that are used to describe emotion? Are there any words that are trying to get me to feel something? What is the scenario that the author is presenting? What is the author's intent or purpose for writing this thing? How are they writing it? Is it in a letter format? Is it in a presentation? Is it is it a story? 
how are they writing this thing? Who is presenting this? Is it from a news source? How do we know that that news source is credible? Is it an independent blog? Is it from Facebook? Where did this come from? When was it written? Does the time period that it was written in have any sort of effect on attitudes toward anything like gender or politics or what the role is of a person in society? Ask yourself all of those questions. The best way to find the answers is by going into the text and start to read and flip through and answer it by looking at what's in the text. Don't give an opinion. Don't give a I think. Start to pull from what is in the text first. Not to give a meaning of how it all works, but to answer those questions. Are there any words that are crazy or that stick out to me or that are action words or that are trying to convey emotion? Well, how do I know? By reading what's in the book. And then after you've given all of those questions answers by looking in the text and figuring out things in the text, then you can start to use those answers to explain or present an interpretation of what you think the author is saying or what the argument is or how the argument is presented. It's a way for you to create meaning by finding the meaning in the text. But you have to be comfortable with sitting there and understanding that everything comes from a context, that everything has a beginning and a middle and an end, and that you, when you're looking at something, are perceiving something from how you're engaging with that medium. John Berger explains this very well in Ways of Seeing. The painting on the wall, like a human eye, can only be in one place at one time. The camera reproduces it, making it available in any size, anywhere, for any purpose. Botticelli's Venus and Mars used to be a unique image, which it was only possible to see in the room where it was actually hanging. Now its image, or a detail of it, or the image of any other painting which is reproduced, can be seen in a million different places at the same time. As you look at them now, on your screen, your wallpaper is round them, your window is opposite them, your carpet is below them. At this same moment, they are on many other screens, surrounded by different objects, different colours, different sounds. You are seeing them in the context of your own life. They are surrounded not by gilt frames, but by the familiarity of the room you are in and the people around you. Once, all these paintings belonged to their own place. Some were altarpieces in churches. Originally, paintings were an integral part of the building for which they were designed. Sometimes, when you go into a Renaissance church or chapel, you have the feeling that the images on the wall are records of the building's interior life. Together, they make up the building's memory. So much are they part of the life and individuality of the building. Everything around the image is part of its meaning. Its uniqueness is part of the uniqueness of the single place where it is. Everything around it confirms and consolidates its meaning. Everything gives the text meaning. Everything around the text Everything around the medium gives the message. The thing that we have to remember is that when we're reading something, when we open up a book, we need to think about what is before and after. We have to put it in a context. We have to start asking questions. We have to start looking at what is going on in the text. And when we do that, we start to understand and pull meaning from what the text is saying, what the author's intention is. We start understanding that when we pull from the text, instead of telling the text what it is, we actually get a fuller picture, a better picture, an understanding of what the text is actually trying to communicate instead of what we want it to communicate. This way stops us from creating conspiracy theories, from misunderstanding 
what people are trying to tell us, arguing with our neighbors instead of loving them or caring about what's going on in the world. And we ignore context to create a world of meaningless information that controls our lives and tosses us around to where we have no idea where we are or what it is we think truly and we just follow the crowd. The saying, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. Well, when we do not understand what's going on in the text, we get lost and we start creating things that aren't there or trying to find things so that way we can create meaning and feel like we understand when in actuality we probably misunderstand, which causes hurt and confusion by examining what is in the text instead of what we think about the text, it brings us to a place where we will not stand for nothing or fall for anything. When we understand what's in the text as the text is, we can truly argue, we can truly understand, we can truly involve ourselves in meaning-making and what it means to be truly and fully human.